Elizabeth Woodville, born into a relatively small and unconnected genteel family around 1437. Elizabeth Woodville grew up to be a great beauty of her time, who was widowed by the age of 24. Her late husband's family disputed her right to her share of her husband's estate. One day she dressed her sons in their best, made herself as alluring as possible and took the boys into the woods for a picnic, choosing a spot under an oak tree that she hoped the hunting party of the king would be likely to pass under that day. The king, struck by her beauty, stopped to speak with her. He became infatuated with her and he decided to take her as his mistress. But Elizabeth refused. He later attempted to force himself upon her, but she drew a knife and threatened to take her own life rather than submit to him. So since he couldn't have her any other way, they married in secret. A marriage treaty was underway with a French princess when the king finally presented her to his council as his lawful wedded wife and queen. The couple had ten children together, seven daughters and three sons. Edward was never faithful to his wife and took many mistresses. The king's passing in 1483 proved a difficult blow, forcing Elizabeth to draw an alliance with the Tudor family to ensure the safety of her own. Julia Agrippina the Younger Both ancient and modern sources describe Agrippina's personality as ruthless, ambitious, violent and domineering. She was born into a life of privilege and was directly connected by blood and marriage to five Roman emperors. She wasn't satisfied living life on the sidelines as was expected of elite Roman women. In 39 AD, she was exiled for plotting against her brother Caligula. In 49 AD, she seduced her uncle and the new emperor Claudius, and they were married on New Year's Day, making her an empress and the most powerful and influential woman in the Roman Empire, even by Roman standards. Such a marriage was considered incestuous and morally wrong. This was her third marriage and his fourth. Claudius later repented on marrying Agrippina and adopting her son Nero. His actions allegedly gave Agrippina a motive to eliminate him. She poisoned Claudius on October 13th, 54, with a plate of deadly mushrooms at a banquet, thus enabling Nero, her son, to quickly take the throne as emperor. She now openly and officially assumed power as de facto co-ruler of Rome during her son's youth. Nero tried to kill his mother in numerous ways. First, he tried to poison her three times. She prevented her death by taking the antidote in advance. Afterwards, he rigged up a machine in her room which would drop her ceiling tiles onto her as she slept. But once again, she escaped her death after she received word of the plan. Nero's final plan was to collapse and sink her boat. She was nearly crushed by the collapsing lead ceiling, only to be saved by the side of her sofa breaking the ceiling's fall, and she swam to shore. Nero eventually ordered the assassination of Agrippina and made it look as if she had committed suicide. He felt so guilty he would have nightmares about her for the rest of his life. He even believed he saw her ghost and paid Persian magicians to scare her away. Clara Petacci Benito Mussolini 
the fascist dictator who led Italy through World War II was a notorious Lothario and his rise to political power perhaps only widened his playing field. Though he had a string of mistresses, only one stayed by his side until the bitter end. Clara Petacci came from a well-connected family. Her father was a doctor for the Vatican and she became Mussolini's mistress at the age of 19. Though Mussolini was a married man with five children, he was hopelessly devoted to his young mistress. The relationship allowed her to be provided for and guarded in style. Mussolini gifted her bodyguards, a chauffeur and lodging in his offices. Their affair came crashing down, however, with Mussolini's fascist regime. In April 1945, the pair attempted to flee the country, but were caught, executed and hung upside down in Milan. Clara did manage to have the final word. Her private diaries, which explicitly detailed her affair, were finally published in 2009. Harriet Wilson. She was one of Georgian England's most prolific courtesans and shrewdest writers. Born and bred in London, she began her career at the tender age of 15 when she became mistress to Earl William Craven. She quickly became a fixture of London high society, even as she was publicly shunned but privately enjoyed by its leading members. She racked up an impressive list of lovers and clients, including Prime Ministers and Royalty, the Duke of Wellington, King George IV and Prime Minister Lord Palmerston. Among dozens of others counted her as mistress at various points in time. Her numerous trysts built her a network of powerful men to whom she could turn when in need. She eventually fell on hard times, but devised an ingenious solution in the 1820s. She penned a memoir and blackmailed former lovers who wished to preserve their anonymity. The choice was clear, pay her or their names would be published in the text. In this way, she used her illicit history as leverage to generate an income. If money is power, she used her romantic liaisons to get both. Lola Montez. The personal and the political collided disastrously in the story of Lola Montez. Born in Ireland in 1821, she spent her childhood in India, England and Scotland and eloped at the age of 19. By 1843, she had left her husband and was trying to jumpstart a career as a professional dancer in Europe. In 1846, she captured the attention of King Ludwig I of Bavaria. As his mistress, she was only too happy to accept gifts from the king, including a stately palace in Munich. Ludwig spent lavishly on Lola and indulged her desire for a title. She became Baroness Rosenthal and Countess of Lansfeld. Though she lacked the title of Queen, Lola nonetheless possessed queenly power. Under her influence, the Bavarian government beckoned to her desires. In 1848, as revolutionary fever swept Europe, Ludwig was forced to abdicate in favour of his son, Maximilian. Lola fled Bavaria and eventually began peddling her stories around the world. While staying in New York City in 1860, she was showing the effect of syphilis and her body began to waste away. She died at the age of 39 on the 17th of January 1861.
Eva Perón, the iconic controversial first lady of Argentina, began life in a small town in 1919 as Maria Eva Duarte, also known as Evita. She was an illegitimate girl with dreams of stardom. She moved to Buenos Aires at the age of 15 and landed several acting and modelling jobs though few consider her a great actress. In 1942, she signed a five-year contract with Radio Belgrano, which assured her a role in a popular historical drama programme called Great Women of History, in which she played Elizabeth I, Sarah Bernhardt and the last Tsarina of Russia. By 1943, Eva was one of the highest paid radio actresses in the nation. Though Eva's rise to stardom was not quite as scandalous as Andrew Lloyd Webber claims in Evita, she had much more to gain when she met rising political star Juan Perón in 1944. Indeed, she unabashedly attached herself to his court tales. On the night of their first meeting, she even threw his teenage mistress out of the house, demonstrating that, as far as she was concerned, there was room for only one woman in his life. Eva's film career was boosted once Perron allegedly funded her production company. Such favours were not one-sided, however. She also supported his political agenda and was a glossy, charismatic social ambassador for his politics. Eva and Juan married in 1945 and the next year were Argentina's president and first lady. Thanks to Eva's influence, women benefited from Perón's working class reforms. Critics of the couple dismissed her, claiming she had no business in politics. But her influence in her husband's government never truly diminished and she has since been regarded as an influential female figure in 20th century politics. Her tenure as First Lady was brief. She died at 8.25pm on Saturday the 26th of July 1952 from cervical cancer at the age of 33. The streets of Buenos Aires overflowed with huge piles of flowers. Within a day of her death, all flower shops in Buenos Aires had run out of stock. Flowers were flown in from all over the country, despite the fact that Eva Perón never held a political office. She was eventually given a state funeral, which was usually reserved for a head of state, along with a full Roman Catholic requiem mass. Mary Ann Clark she was married at just 15 to Joseph Clark, the son of a wealthy stonemason. However, three years after the marriage, her husband went bankrupt and Mary left, taking their children with her. Mary became a courtesan to generate income for her young family. She quickly climbed the ranks of high society in early 19th century London eventually attracting the attention of Frederick, Duke of York, the second son of King George III and Commander-in-Chief of the British Army. Their relationship came crashing down in 1806 when he ended the affair. As recompense, Mary loudly said that she had trafficked military appointments. While she was the Duke's mistress, officers would bribe her for promotions and she pocketed the income. The allegations scandalised a nation deep in war within Napoleon's France and resulted in an inquiry by the House of Commons. She was prosecuted for liable in 1813 and imprisoned for nine months. On her release from prison, 
She went to live in France where she died in 1852. In 1954, her great-granddaughter Daphne de Maurier wrote a fictionalised life story of her great-grandmother. The novel was called Mary Ann. Empress Theodora she was born circa 500 AD. Her father was a bear trainer and her mother a dancer and actress. When she was four, her father died and her mother brought Theodora and her two younger sisters wearing garlands into the Hippodrome and presented them as suppliants to the chariot races. From then on, Theodora would be her younger sister's supporter. From an early age, Theodora worked in a Constantinople brothel, serving low-status customers. Later, she performed on stage and made a name for herself with her portrayal as Leda and the Swan. She would, um, put seed somewhere intimate and the Swan would then eat it. I think that's enough said on that. At the age of 16, Theodora travelled to North Africa. Here she met Justinian, or Justin, heir to the Byzantine Empire. Though he fell madly in love with Theodora, he could not marry her, as unions between public officials and actresses were forbidden. But Justin passed a new law which decreed that reformed actresses could thereafter legally marry outside their rank if approved by the emperor. In the future, the same law allowed her illegitimate daughter, whose name has been lost, to marry one of the previous emperor's relatives. Justin assumed the throne in 527 AD with Theodora at his side. They were two of the most powerful people in the world. She shared in his plans and political strategies, participated in state councils, and Justin called her my partner in my deliberations. She had her own court, her own official entourage, and her own imperial seal. She proved herself a worthy and able leader. She died of cancer on the 28th of June, 548, at the age of 48. Along with her spouse, Theodora is a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church and in the Oriental Orthodox Church. Anya Sorel, also known as the Lady of Beauty. As the first official royal mistress of France from 1444 to 1450, she commanded power and influence in the court of King Charles VII. Charles's affection for her scandalised the French court and earned her many enemies. Her fashion choices were as bold and daring as her public affair. She wore dresses so that one breast was always completely exposed. Charles gifted her lands, a private residence and mountains of jewels, including what might have been the first cut diamond. She did not seek royal favours only for herself. She used her position to advance the fortunes and standing of her family. Her tenure was relatively brief. She passed due to mercury ingestion at the age of 28 in 1450. Some even suspect foul play was involved in her demise. Charles's son, the future King Louis XI, had been in open revolt against his father for the previous four years. It has been speculated that he had her poisoned in order to remove what he may have considered her undue influence over the king. Diane de Portier, one of the most beautiful, intelligent and fashionable women in the 16th century French court, Diane caught the eye of Prince Henry 
heir to the throne and a man 20 years her junior. She grew to be an essential figure in Henry's life throughout his reign. When they first met at the tournament held for the coronation of King Francis's new wife, Eleanor of Austria, in 1531, the king was expected to salute the new queen, but Henry addressed his salute to Diane as a royal mistress. She held no official power in the court, but her relationship with the king did afford her influence and favours. She eclipsed the queen in the royal court, and Henry lavished her with gifts and land. When Henry died in a jousting accident, in 1551, Diane fell dramatically. Queen Catherine de' Medici, Henry's widow and new queen regent, swiftly reduced Diane's position, even forcing her to trade castles. Diane passed 15 years after Henry, aged 66. When experts dug up her remains in 2009, they found her death was self-inflicted but accidental. She consumed drinkable gold to preserve her youth and beauty, which ultimately led to her death. Madame de Pompadour Growing up in a well-off but not noble family, she was groomed by her family to be a royal mistress from a very young age. She was well-educated and made good use of her sharp intelligence. She first came to the attention of King Louis XV at a masked ball in 1745. Following the encounter, she quickly became the king's chief mistress. She took charge of the king's schedule and was a valued aide and advisor. She secured titles of nobility for herself and her relatives and built a network of clients and supporters. Through her position at court, she wielded considerable power. She was elevated on the 12th of October 1752 to Duchess and in 1756 to Lady-in-Waiting to the Queen, which was the most noble rank possible for a woman at court. She effectively played the role of Prime Minister, becoming responsible for appointing advancements favours and dismissals and contributing in domestic and foreign policies. Critics at the time generally tarred her as a malevolent political influence, but historians are more favourable, emphasising her success as a patron of the arts and a champion of French pride. She was able to wield such influence at court due to the invaluable role she played as a friend and confidant to the king. In opposition to previous mistresses of King Louis XV, she made herself invaluable to him by becoming the only person whom Louis trusted and who could be counted on to tell him the truth. Louis remained devoted to her until her death from tuberculosis in 1764 at the age of 42. Wallace Simpson She was a glamorous American divorcee who caught the eye of the future King of England in 1931. Edward was known for his dalliances and he cultivated a reputation as a playboy prince. Everyone assumed his fling with Wallace would be short-lived. When Edward ascended the throne following his father's passing in 1936, he made it clear that he wanted Wallace at his side. Contrary to his wishes, the relatively conservative British government wouldn't accept a divorced woman as the Queen because divorce was forbidden by the Church of England. 
Rather than reigning without the woman he loved, Edward abdicated in favour of his younger brother, who became King George VI. Wallace and Edward married soon after, and she accompanied Edward on his appointment as Governor of the Bahamas. Though she never achieved the privilege or title of Queen, she was dubbed Duchess of Windsor after the couple married. Cleopatra Historically, Cleopatra is cast as the ultimate femme fatale, whose influence supposedly ruined a good man's career and resulted in his demise, never mind her own. In reality, she was a shrewd politician whose primary objective was to preserve the autonomy of Egypt in the face of Roman aggression and expansion. To that end, she strove to make Roman allies through the only means accessible to a woman of that era. Cleopatra first engaged in an affair with Julius Caesar and even bore him a son. After Caesar's murder at the hands of senators in 44 BC, she took as her new lover and eventual husband, Mark Antony. Their love affair produced three children but did not safeguard Egypt as she had hoped. By 30 BC, Caesar's adopted son and heir, Octavian, defeated Antony and Cleopatra's forces on land and sea. The lover's ends are prototypical of literature and legend. Antony and Cleopatra each took their own life. Antony fell on his sword and Cleopatra pressed an ass to her breast. Gabrielle D'Estre She was a royal mistress with political ambitions. In 1590, the 17-year-old French noblewoman became the mistress of King Henry, a Protestant king leading a Catholic majority country in a climate of religious warfare sweeping Europe. Gabrielle, loyal to her king, was also a loyal Catholic and used her position to convince Henry to renounce Protestantism and return to the Catholic faith. Proven to be an asset to the king, and though she had no official power, she did wield social capital. When Henry issued an edict granting Protestants rights, she used her social and diplomatic skill to quiet vocal criticism from Catholic nobles. With pride, Henry claimed, My mistress has become an orator of unequalled brilliance. So fiercely does she argue the cause of the new edict. Henry sought an annulment from the Pope in the hopes of wedding his mistress, but after delivering a stillborn baby, she passed in 1599 at the age of 26, due to eclampsia. Marion Davis Born Marion Darkus in 1897, Brooklyn, Marion always harboured dreams of stardom. She got her start as a showgirl on Broadway, and by 1917, she was starring in a film she herself had written. She quickly found an audience substantial enough to attract the attention of newspaper tycoon William Randolph Hearst. William immediately set out to make his mistress a star. He even founded a production company, Cosmopolitan Pictures, in 1918 to produce and promote her work. He oversaw her career to the point of obsession, brokering deals and advertising her performances in his newspaper empire. Though she was a natural comedian with ambitions of screenwriting, her affair held her back, as people assumed she was getting ahead because of her relationship with Hearst and not because of her talent. In the film Citizen Kane, 1941, the title character's second wife, 
an untalented singer whom he tries to promote was widely assumed to be based on Davis. But many commentators, including Citizen Kane writer and director Orson Welles himself, have defended her record as a gifted actress to whom Hearst's patronage did more harm than good. She retired from the screen in 1937, choosing to devote herself to William Hearst and charitable work. Since the early 1920s, there has been speculation that Davis and Hearst had a child together sometime between 1920 and 1923. The child was rumoured to be Patricia Lake, née Van Cleve, who was publicly identified as Marion's niece. On October 3rd, 1993, Patricia died of complications from lung cancer in California. Ten hours before her death, she requested that her son publicly announce that she was not Marion's niece, but her biological daughter. Patricia had never commented on her alleged paternity in public. Marion reportedly told her of her true parentage when she was just 11 years old. 11 weeks and one day after Hearst's death, Marion married Horace Brown. On October 31st, 1951, it was not a happy marriage. She died of stomach cancer on September 22nd, 1961, in her home in Hollywood, California. Aspasia She was a key figure in the cultural and political life of ancient Athens, thanks to no small part to the fact that she was the mistress of Pericles, one of the most powerful and important statesmen in the ancient world. She was born around 470 BC and was an immigrant to Athens. From around 445 BC, she was Pericles' mistress and an Athenian courtesan. Though both ancient and contemporary sources differ on details of her life, they agree on many aspects. She was officially a concubine, was witty, intelligent, articulate, and used her proximity to Pericles to entertain and debate with powerful men. Indeed, Socrates was a regular visitor who delighted in debating with her. There have been suggestions Pericles turned to her as an advisor, but what actual influence she had remains unknown. She did, however, face substantial criticism. Her relationship to Pericles was parodied in stage comedies and questioned by the Senate, as many felt she was a wicked, scandalous presence who overstepped her bounds as a woman. Many politicians even blame her for political and military blunders. They feared Pericles was merely a puppet overseen by Aspasia's whims. Given their commitment to one another, she was more than likely devastated when he succumbed to the plague in 429 BC. She outlived him by nearly three decades, passing around 401 or 400 BC. Scholars continue to debate her legacy even centuries later. And this concludes the video. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please click the like button, give it a thumbs up and please subscribe for future videos. Thank you.